good to be here with you all. And it's good to see some of the familiar faces. Lucas, Michelle, love you guys. Um, I'm grateful for Coastline all together. I love being part of the Coastline family. It's been a joy. My wife, her name is Rebecca. We have uh, four kids, three daughters and one son. And we've just really enjoyed being part of the family here at Coastline and being specifically in Destin the last three years. We've been pastoring there uh, without Neil Spencer for two years. And uh, Neil's a great friend. John's a great friend. And the whole Spencer family, we just have really been blessed by and so appreciate them being in our lives and meeting them. And and it's really good to be here with you guys this morning. And so we're going to be in the book of Psalms. If you have your Bibles... Please turn your Bible open to to Psalm 128. That's where we'll be this morning. If you're online this morning, we welcome you. It's great to have you on as well. Uh, Those that might be tuning in from Destin. Also, I know my parents will be tuning in from California, maybe a few others. So welcome you guys as well. Um, It's good to have you here with us online. And so, have you guys been enjoying the book of Psalms? Yes. Yes. They've been really good. They've been rich. We've been in the same series, Psalmer Time, as well, in Destin, and our church have been, been really enjoying them. We've been looking over Psalm 91. We went over that two weeks ago where God promises this wonderful protection, I'll say. We almost have a private bodyguard, a secure in the Lord. Uh, he opens up that psalm, those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. That shadows this picture of uh, protection from the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I get to have that. And we've looked over 139, if you're familiar with that one, understanding that God has perfect knowledge of man. David says that it's, it's so perfect and wonderful, he can hardly attain and understand it. Too high for him to understand. And today we're going to be in a psalm. It's been a little treasure of mine. I I did teach it a few weeks ago in Destin, and I wanted to teach it to you guys today. It's really short. It's only six verses. Actually, we're only going to cover the first three today. But I hope it is a blessing to you. I hope it encourages you. I hope it challenges you, especially men in the house today. Raise your hand if you are a man. Well, of course you are. You're a man out there, right? Raise your hand if you're a husband. Any husbands? Raise your hand if you are a father. Well, this applies to you. This, is, this message, I want to speak to you directly. I believe it's a psalm specifically to the man of the house. The man of the house, a husband and father. Now, when you look at it, verse 1, it says, blessed is everyone. It does have this universal application where it applies to each one. Every child here, every single person here, grandma, grandpa, every one of you. So don't check out. This is for you because the text says, blessed is everyone. The one, I, the why I brought up, it's, it's specifically addressed to the man of the house, especially one that wants to be blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice with me, verse 3, he says, your wife. So that's talking to a man specifically. And I think in general, this whole psalm is addressed to the man of the house. So let me go ahead and read it, and then we're going to pray, and we'll jump right into it. It says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat The labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife, our dear wives, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Young men, haven't you always dreamed of your wife being a vine in the center of your heart, of your house? I always thought of that. And then your children. Your children will be like olive plants all around your table. And then he goes on to say, verse 4, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. 
Yes, may you see your children's children. Children's children. So again, blessings. God wants to bless you men today. He wants to bless you. And that word blessed here in verse 1 talks about and describes being happy. Happy is the man who fears the Lord. Or happy is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. It also describes someone who is, I love this, fulfilled or satisfied. Satisfied is the man who fears the Lord. Satisfied is the man who walks in his way. I, unfortunately, I've lived now this life for 42 years. I'm 42 years old and I've seen many men that have not experienced happiness or they've never experienced the blessings of God. They've never ever experienced being really satisfied or fulfilled. I, I actually thought about the song for those that were maybe born in the, maybe what is it, 60s, perhaps 70s, a man named Mick Jagger, who was the lead singer of the, what is it, the Rolling Stones, I think he was, right? He, he sung all about, I can't get no satisfaction. He was a man that he tried and tried and tried, but he could never and never had, never experienced satisfaction. I'm here to encourage you, church, men especially in the house, men of the household. If you're a man of God, if you are born of God, if you have been born again, you can experience a happy home. You can experience happiness in your workplace, enjoyment in your workplace, in your employment. You can experience a happy wife. Unfortunately, again, I've walked into homes, perhaps you have too, where the home is not a happy home. It's a home full of anger, bitterness, division. Kids get to experience that as well. It's so sad to see where God says, no, I want to make your home, I want to make your marriage relationship, all your relationships. I want to make your workplace a place where you are blessed, where you're satisfied, where you feel fulfilled. Notice with me in verse 1, as we talked about bless, happy, he said, is everyone who fears the Lord. If you want men to be blessed, if you want to experience happiness, if you want to experience being satisfied in life, here's the first application God gives to us for us to apply to our lives. It's to fear the Lord. What does it mean? To fear the Lord. Well, I want to first share, if you're taking notes, say what it doesn't mean to fear the Lord. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God in the sense of punishment or condemnation. Some people look at this being afraid. Well, I'm I'm afraid of God. And it's, it's not that. What it means is for the believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So if you're a believer in this house this morning, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 5, Paul says, that you've been justified, just as if you've never sinned. Sin has been done away with, it's been taken care of, it's been paid for, you've been justified, you've been declared right by God, And that is really good news for you and I. So when it says, blessed are those who fear the Lord, it's not fearing God or being afraid of God about punishment and condemnation. For that doesn't apply to us as Christians. Praise God for that. But I do want to say, and especially for maybe those that are listening online, if that is not you, if you're not a born-again believer, if you're not in Christ, if you don't belong to Christ, if you never made that decision, then you should be afraid of punishment and condemnation for your sin. If that's you here today, your sin has not been taken care of. I want to make that clear. 
It hasn't been forgiven. And so therefore the Bible says you're an enemy to God. And you'll die in your sin, Paul says in Romans. And you will be guilty of sin and condemned to eternal hell. Now that's the bad news. But again, back to the good news If that's you and you've never received Jesus Christ, if you're not in Christ, if you don't belong to him, God is saying to you today, online, maybe perhaps an individual right here in this room, he's saying, I want to reconcile you back to me. You can be reconciled back to God. Today's the day, my friends. If you've not done that, that's where it begins. You can either be an enemy to God or a friend to God. And the one that determines that is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Have you done that today? Are you an enemy or are you a friend? If you want to be reconciled today to God, you could put your, again, full trust. Just like as I jump out of an airplane, I'm really putting my trust in that parachute to save me. If you're not here today and you don't have Christ in your life, you're jumping out of that plane with no parachute and you're going to figure out a way to save yourself and we know how that ends. It doesn't end well, does it? It's death when you hit that ground. But if you put your faith, full faith in Jesus Christ today, you become secure in his righteousness. He puts his righteousness in you through, again, the work of the Holy Spirit by putting faith in Jesus Christ. And you again will be no more guilty of sin or condemned to eternal hell. So, the Bible says, do not harden your heart to God. If that's you again and he's speaking to your heart, if you've been maybe seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're seeking truth, if you're lost, you're trying to figure out what this world's about and You have a hole, you have an emptiness in your life. The answer, again, is Jesus. We say that a lot here from I Know This Pulpit. I know John teaches that, Neil does. But this is the message we are to be about, to be committed to, and I want to share that and make it as clear as can be this morning. Don't harden your heart to him today. Hear his voice, make him Lord and Savior of your life. Be at peace with God. There's some, when I, when I think of peace, oftentimes I, I go back to our season in Ireland. We were there for three years. And so many of the Irish men that I, I came across and spent time with, I would talk to them about Jesus, of course. We'd get to the subject of peace, and so many, and I know that's here in America as well, but at least it was there, so many never experienced the peace of God. I remember looking right in, 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 in the eyes of a man there in Galway, And I asked him this question, have you ever experienced peace? He goes, I've never. And this man, you know, he was probably 55 years old. He goes, I've never experienced any peace in my life at all. Today, my friends, you can have peace. You can be a friend of God. You can be at peace with God and actually experience his peace and be an enemy no more to him. So let's go back to what is fearing the Lord. We now know what it's not, what is fearing the Lord? Well, Psalm 11.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. Number two, Proverbs 8.18 says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Men, are you hating evil? That's fearing the Lord. A definition I even like better, I want to share with you this morning, which I think sums up this fear of the Lord. It's A man who has an inner heart attitude that deeply respects God and takes him seriously. Let me read that again. It's a man or a person who has an inner heart attitude that deeply respects God and takes him seriously. It's one who is eager to please God in everything. It's a heart that loves God and doesn't want to do anything, here it is, to offend him or to grieve him. Blessed is everyone, the man that fears the Lord, that deeply respects God, doesn't want to offend him, wants to please him and never grieve him. It's like the teenage 
story or a, a story of a teenage girl who was out on a date with her boyfriend and the story is told that when their time together was getting past the time she was supposed to be home, the teenage girl said to her boyfriend, you need to take me home. She said, my dad told me I need to be home by 10 o'clock. And it's that time in the boyfriend, this is a naughty boyfriend, should have not said this, the boyfriend said, what are you afraid of? Are, are you afraid of what your dad is going to do to you? And I love the response of the teenage girl. She goes, no, I'm actually afraid of what I'll do to him. So fearing the Lord, friends, is not, again, fearing what God will do to you. It's fearing and being concerned about what your actions will do to him. Some of you guys might be asking right now, what are those things that I should be concerned about? that affect the Lord in that way. Well, Paul says in Ephesians 4, he says, be concerned about this. Be concerned about grieving the Holy Spirit. He says, do not grieve, Ephesians chapter 4, the Holy Spirit. What are the things that grieve the Holy Spirit? He goes on to say in Ephesians 4, lying, which lying to God or people. God actually hates lying, a lying tongue. Being angry at people. Are you angry today, church? These are some of the things that grieve the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. He says, stealing is one from people, using corrupt words towards people, having bitterness towards one another, shouting out of control, clamor to, uh, that's the word he uses, speaking evil about someone and things alike. But again, I wanted to remind you, when we're in Christ, If I, which I have, committed these things, I'm not wanting to practice these things, there's a difference, but when I do fall short in sin and I maybe get angry or I have bitterness, it doesn't, again, change our position in Christ. It doesn't change the the, the love that God has for us, but it does, we need to know, it grieves him. It saddens him. We, of course, when we fall short and commit these kind of things, The Bible says we are to confess our sins because, again, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. But, again, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, a one who is concerned how his actions affect the Lord. Again, I want to keep going a little bit in Ephesians 4. But he says, but for you, believer, he says, because you have heard and been taught by Christ, you should no longer walk in those things. No longer walk as the rest walk. He says, put off your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. But he says, Christian, be renewed. That's a thing we want to do every day be renewed in the holy spirit or in the spirit of your mind putting on the new man creating according to god in true righteousness and holiness question i have for us what is being renewed of your spirit or of your mind what is that what's being renewed of your mind well for some it might be well it's getting on facebook every morning and checking my posts and getting on instagram and that, that renews my mind. That's not what renews our minds. I know it's a go-to, and I, and I know there's a lot of good when we check our Facebook feeds. And again, Coastline Gulf Breeze has a great Facebook feed. You get all these wonderful devotions from John and Neil and the staff, and that is a part to renewing your mind. But again, coming to Jesus, spending time with him every day, reading scripture, meditating on his word. That's what Psalm 1 is saying. You're going to be happy when you delight and meditate on God's word. Praying, listening. This is a big one. When you are in that place, reading and listening, you surrender, Lord, I surrender my will today to you. All of these things, again, are part of renewing your mind. And it also will grow I may grow your heart that again deeply respects God and will be, it will make it eager to please him and not to grieve him. So, blessed is he who fears the Lord. 
Blessed is he who fears the Lord. It, it speaks upon the heart, and then when the heart is being changed and transformed by God naturally, naturally there's an action that should come. There's a walk. And we see this right here in Psalm. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, and then what's the action? Walk in his ways. When both the heart and the walk are with God, men, ladies, you will experience the blessings of God. You'll experience the blessings of God. When you apply these things, look where again he wants to bless you. And I know there's a lot of areas he wants to bless us. That's the God he is. But specifically in this psalm, which is unique, he, he wants to bless you men in your workplace. He says, verse 2, when you eat, and again, I get that, labor of your hands. He also wants to bless you in the home, and that's where I get verse 3, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, and your children like olive plants around your table. What a, an amazing illustration. Let's talk about how does God want to bless you in your work? Well, a couple things I want to mention. Part of God's ways, most of you probably know this, but I got to just remind you. Again, I I don't know why I go back to Ireland a lot, but it's a socialist country, and so a lot of the people rely on the government, and that government supplies all that they need for the most part. And so that encourages not to work. They don't see any good in work, that it's valuable, and that's exactly who we serve. God is... Oh, God of labors, he's all about. It's part of his ways is for us to labor, to work hard. It's it's a calling for all of us, no matter where you are. In the corporate world, on the fields, a farmer maybe, in a hospital, maybe serving here at the church. God has called each one of us to labor and to work hard. And without God, working is actually pointless. It doesn't mean anything. But when we labor with God, and this is what I I believe verse 2 is talking about, there's a promise given by God. The promise is given that the work will be fruitful and that you will enjoy the compensation. You'll enjoy what you receive. I love what Apostle Paul says here in Colossians 3.22. I think he sums it up well. Verse 2, I think he gives more understanding of what uh, the kind of man God blesses when he works, uh, as Paul describes here. He says, servants. He's talking to the church, the believer. Obey your masters in all things. Obey your masters in all things. Those bosses that are above you. He says, obey them in all things. He goes on to say, not with eye service, nor as a man pleaser. Don't just work hard because he's looking at you. Do it because God's looking. He says, but work in sincerity of heart, fearing God. There's that word. Do it because you fear God. And whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. That's why we work. We don't do it for necessarily the boss or for people that are looking. We do it for the Lord, not to men, and God will reward you. And I, again, verse 2, what I believe what he's saying, when you fear the Lord in your workplace, when you are applying these things, God not only will provide for you, he will, uh, your, he'll bless your hands that you, know, that you put your uh, hands to, the work, but the key is you're going to enjoy the food that he provides. I don't really think about this much, but I did this week as I was preparing this study in that That word eat, he says when you eat, it's a description of when you devour it. And when I work hard, I don't know about you, and maybe when you work hard, you get home and you're hungry. And when the meal's set before you, it's not just eating, you devour it. I remember coming home from, it was the week of Father's Day actually, it was the the week before Father's Day, the Sunday, and it was a long full week, we worked hard, and I remember coming home from church that Sunday and I sat down and I have my fruitful vine in the heart of the house, my lovely wife. I have my olive plants there, my four kids around the table. 
And, and, and as a man, you're hungry. It's been a long week. They've been laboring so hard that afternoon just to bless their dad and my mom, or my mom, my, my wife to bless her husband. And, you know, a tri-tip's right there in front of me. I got some mashed potatoes there, some of my favorite, a salad, and just to, to end it off with a nice banana cream pie, one of my favorites. Now, if you're a Southern man, I, I'm getting familiar more with the, the menus here in, in Southern country here. It could have been for you, maybe a little blackened grouper, snapper, possibly, blue crab. Never tried it, but I know that's popular here. Maybe with little collard greens there, which I don't really go to those much, but I know a lot of you guys like those. Another crazy word, and I got to try these not too long ago, but you ever heard of hush puppies? (laughs) Maybe you got a little hush puppy there, you got a little collard green, a little grouper going, and you devour it and you are blessed. And I think this is what God is saying, when you work hard and you do it unto me, You get home, you devour that meal, it's going to be great going in, and it's going to be a blessing. Now, I'm not going to say going out, that's not what I mean. But, men, you understand, once you're full and you've eaten a great meal like I just described, you feel blessed. I want to not just take a nap, but I feel satisfied. That's what God wants to do. Simple. But it's a blessing. It's one of the blessings that he wants us to enjoy. And again, it's for everyone, not just for the man of the house. But man, I do believe it's it's he's addressing us here. Work hard, work unto the Lord, not as men pleasers. No, don't do it to just you know work hard when your boss is looking. Do it unto the Lord. God will bless you, he'll honor it, and you will be again satisfied. I love that. Now, God does want to bless you in your workplace, but you need to remember this as well. I think a lot of people misunderstand, and I want to make a note. I'm going to use a couple examples here. But when we do talk about blessing, and even a couple weeks ago when I talked about God promises protection and security, it's actually it's fascinating. It's what the world desires. They want happiness and security. They, they work hard for it. They labor for it. But again, what's great, we get to have that within having a relationship with the Lord. But again, when we, when we talk about these things, we think life's just going to be grand and wonderful, no problems, no suffering. It's all going to be good. And that's really far from the truth here. I want to make sure that just because you fear the Lord or you are a man or a woman who fears the Lord God or walks in His way, it doesn't mean that you'll never go through hard times or face financial struggles. That might be something God allows, and he's got a plan. He wants to produce something good in you, just like Paul says in Romans. There's always good in hard times. I I feel like we have to go through difficult times or we'll never grow as Christians. So there's a balance as a believer. Yes, he wants to protect you. He wants to bring security. He also wants to make you happy and give you a happy home. But don't forget in that, even if you fear the Lord and walk in his ways, Because God's out of his perfect love, actually, and because he knows you so well, he will allow things in your life, difficult times, hardships, suffering. It's a word that none of us like, but it's going to be for your good and it's going to be for his glory. Couple, um, one, one example, Paul the Apostle in Philippians, he talks about how he had times of abundance, the great apostle, times of abundance and He also had times where he did not have a lot at all. But what he did say, don't be discouraged. God shall supply all your need according to his riches riches in glory by Christ. I think about Job. I've been thinking about Job a lot in these these, uh, scriptures that we've been studying. Job was a man who was blameless, God said, upright, who feared God. He shunned evil. God said there was no one on earth like Job. And you know, you start chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 and you keep reading and you're going, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Again, out of God's perfect love and knowledge, he allowed Satan, some of you know the story, to destroy his family, took away his livestock, his property was gone, he allowed Satan to attack Job's health, struck him with boils all from his feet to his head. But in that time, if you keep reading through the story of Job, God revealed his wisdom, 
He revealed his power, his majesty, his goodness. He challenged Job. He taught Job all these things. Blessings, you could say, in disguise. Job might have not seen them as blessings, but they were. And I love at the end of Job's story, look what, look what God said. And God restored what Job had lost. God gave Job twice as much as he had before. God blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. And so again, church, we must remember, even though you walk in the ways of the Lord and fear the Lord, you will experience hardships. And again, they're for your good and for God's glory. The second area, as God wants to bless you, or what he wants to bless you in is the home. And again, this is for my men out there, husbands, fathers. I'm going to combine the the wife part and the kid part. Take notes. I've been learning these things more and more. I've failed a lot in these areas. I've not done good sometimes. Um, Creating, I'll say, an environment for my wife to be this very description of what this psalm says in verse 3, a fruitful vine in the very heart of my home. But God wants to help each one of you men to get there. Baby steps. Baby steps. But again, in the home, how does God want to bless? Well, men, as we fear the Lord and please him, and we actually apply these things God says to do in the context of the house, part of that is taking on the roles that God has committed to you and has given to you as men. So when we fear the Lord, we walk in his ways, part of that is taking on the roles that he's given to you and I. And when we do that, we create an environment. Proverbs 31 talks about this. It's actually in Proverbs 31, a mom is talking to a son, saying this is what you should stay away from, son, and this is what you ought to be looking for, but also to find, that word find describes You ought to create an environment for your wife to flourish like this beautiful, virtuous woman that Proverbs 31 describes. Big responsibility God's given to us. But he doesn't leave us by ourselves to do that, men. So what are these roles that God has given to you and I as men of the household? Number one, if you want to write them down, he's called us to be the protector. Adam should have protected Eve in the very beginning. He didn't. I believe that. I know there's a lot of views, different opinions on that, but I think if Adam did his job, it'd be a different situation. But we are to be a protector, a a one who protects our wives from the things that would harm them, like unkind or unhealthy relationships. Uh, Protect her time so she can think. I'm learning this as being a homeschool father and having four kids and Mom, I know you do so much, and then you add homeschooling and a bunch of other things. You don't have much time at all to think. It's like, Mom, 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 Mom. And you, you don't know. It's, it's overwhelming sometimes, but men, we've got to protect her time, and we need to initiate that for her to think, to be refreshed, to rest, to fellowship, to build friendships. Again, I felt in that a lot of my past. I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. And I've seen the fruit of it for sure. We are to protect her by making the unpleasant phone calls. I'm just kind of listing a few here. I know there's a lot more, but as simple as if there's a phone call, men, you need to make, you need to make it. If it's hard, if it's unpleasant, the challenging phone calls, that is a way for us to protect them. Number two, God has called us to be the provider. We've spoke about that, Exodus 34, 1 Timothy 5, 8, 2 Thessalonians 3. We must be willing to work and expect to work, to be the provider, men of the household. Timothy, or Paul says to Timothy, anyone who does not provide for his own, he has denied the faith and he is worse than an unbeliever. It's very important. Not to say that women cannot work. Again, I said in the very beginning, We're all to be laborers. In the house, in the fields, whatever it is, we are to work hard. And then number three, God has called you and I the initiator. Genesis 3, 17, 3, 20. We're to initiate dates. We are to initiate men love and affection. We are to initiate time away. Don't count on her to make those things and make it happen. 
We need to initiate things to spend money on, talk about those things, financial things. We need to initiate conversation about vision for the family. These are all things, again, I failed in. And I'm so grateful the Lord opened my eyes to these things through men and scripture, people that encourage me. This is how it is for God to bless the home and, again, to see just wonderful things in the home, to, to have a happy home. Men, it's up to us to create this wonderful environment. Yes, God has a part. He strengthened us. He gives us wisdom. He gives us the ability to do it. But we have a part to choose and to actually do it. It's hard work. It's up to us. And then he's called us to love, to be patient, kind, not to be full of pride, not to be rude. Oh, I see this so often. It breaks my heart and I walk into homes or places where the husband is just treating his wife so harshly, so so rude. And God, again, that grieves God and the spirit inside us. He says, do not seek your own. We need to build them up, encourage them, be their cheerleader. My wife loves me being her cheerleader. Give them some high fives and all those good things. Don't make them feel dumb. But you are to be, men, a safe place for them, a sanctuary. That's our job. That's our role. And when we, again, apply these things, I'm telling you, you will see a happy home. You will see a happy home. Again, quickly, same for the kids. I believe as we seek to do God's way in the home, creating an environment for our kids to grow, to be fruitful, you will see them as these beautiful little olive plants around your table. Quickly, Ephesians 6, 4, God's way for us as men. He says, Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Men, have you ever provoked your kid to be angry? God says, don't provoke your kids to anger. But, he says, bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord, rather. And what does that mean? It means to love them. It means to discipline them. It means to instruct them. That's our job for our kids. Creating an environment for them to grow and to love them, to discipline them, to instruct them. To instruct them in what? Well, to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Deuteronomy 6. When you lie down with them, when you walk with them, when you sit with them, put them on the doorpost. Whenever you're with them, encourage them in the Lord. Encourage them to love God with all their heart. Moses said in Deuteronomy. And so to end here, and this is where I went, I'm not going to go into the the nation, but again, when a man and a woman, people fear the Lord, I was thinking about this this week, what if the United States, every person feared the Lord, deeply respected, took God seriously, didn't want to hurt him or sadden him, but please him, walk in his ways, just think what this nation would look like, amen? God has given us the answers right here. And I know there's a lot more, but I think this is so crucial. And again, divorce is rampant and in the church, in the world. And again, we apply these things. Instead of seeing a, a divorce or fractured or broken home, I, I believe we're going to be seeing homes that actually heal or restore and that are blessed. So men, it's up to you and I. John Phillips, and I'm going to close with this. He said this, the welfare of the state depends upon the welfare of the home. Listen to these words, so powerful. The welfare of our state depends upon the welfare of the home. The welfare of the home depends upon the spiritual condition of the head of the home. It all starts, my friends, in the home. And I am so grateful for my mom and dad walking with God, being able to experience that, to to be blessed by that. And I pray that for your homes. Again, if you're single, though, don't tune out on this. These are things you need to think about, start applying now. Fear the Lord, walk in His ways. Prepare your hearts too. Maybe perhaps you get married one day to work hard. Don't be lazy. God wants you to work hard. He wants you to create an environment for your wife to flourish and grow, 
to be that virtuous wife that we see in Proverbs 31. He wants you to create an environment where your kids can grow and be fruitful and know who God is and to walk with God. And he says, men, it's up to you. But he, he does say, though, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to empower you. But you need to depend on me. And that's where it's going again. He who dwells in the secret place, just you can think of it, it's a little holy of holies, a little presence with God. We stay near with God. In that place, surrender all to him. And I'm telling you, he will give you exactly what you need to do that day for your family.